you so much, Steve, for joining us today. Um, so when I first knew I was going to um, be speaking with um, Steve Veg, I asked him to send me a bio. And, um, oh, did I get a bio? So I'm going to read just the opening paragraph. Imagine combining an Indian river for the fish made famous by Rudyard Kipling's poem, The Golden Mashir. Picture yourself perched atop a thoroughbred racehorse as it gallops at top speed over six furlongs. Visualize a Native American tribal ceremony with you at the honorary eagle dancer. Steve Edge has done it all and so, so much more. So where do you start when that's your biog? And that's not even it. So Steve, tell us more. Well, it's great to see you all. And, and obviously, what a great organization. And it's, uh, you know, for me, it's about never missing a golden opportunity. I think in life, we're offered so many things that we say no to. And, you know, I've always looked for adventures and I've always had dreams. And you need to have a dream, but you also have to say yes to it. You have to believe in it. And luckily for me, I was born severely dyslexic with learning difficulties like OCD and all those other things that comes with us creatives. And, uh, and so never reading a book in my life because I can't. Luckily, my wife Sylvie reads to me every morning and she read one morning to me things that I wanna hear. And she read, listen to this, there's a poem written by Rajar Kipling and, 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 and this poem is said that uh, a tarpon is a mere herring compared to a masia. For whoever can land a masia is a true angler. Now, now listen, I'm a fisherman and I went, we're going. We are going fishing to India. And, uh, and we went, I managed to find a fantastic man who helped me with some guides and we caught the golden masia, this fish ah. called the golden masia. Anyway, the fish went back and, uh, and then I was invited to ride a racehorse and, and, um, in a race because I love riding and I rode the horse. And then, and then many years later, I, uh, my, one of my families had married into a very special Indian tribe, a man called Chief Dan George, who was a very famous Indian in Canada. And uh, he was in a film called Outlaw Josie Wells. And... I was made an eagle dancer, a chief in 1980. And, and so, you know, life is full of amazing journeys and never say no. And um, what do you have to do when you're an eagle dancer? Well, you have to be a bit radio rental, I think, you know, <laughs> mental. Uh, you know, I didn't sit still and I never sat still. And when I was in Canada, I used to go to Canada a lot because, of course, my, all my Indian relatives are there, the Coast Salish tribe. And they sussed me that actually, you know, I was definitely eagle dancer. Um, <laughs> and, and therefore, they made me eagle dancer. And that is my Indian name. I'd love to, I'd love to see that. So, <laughs> um, so tell me, where did you grow up? So where I am now, here I am in Shoreditch, you know, 40 years ago, ironically, if you came to Shoreditch, you came to be killed. You know, now it's become trendy and, uh, and, and hipsterville. But, but when I was a kid, way back, I was born right next door to Shoreditch. And, and I'm here um, and grew up in a place called Bethnal Green. But luckily for me, at four years old, I was very fortunate because three things happened. One, I found my passion at four. I discovered glitter, magic markers, and plastic scissors, and things have never changed. Two, I was diagnosed with severe learning difficulties, which in those days wasn't particularly learning difficulties. You were seen as the idiot, the village, the village idiot. And uh, I was sent to school, but then sent back and said that this kid is uh, unteachable. And thirdly, I discovered fishing. So <coughs> lucky me, um, for me growing up, I'm in a poor family. We were a poor family, not poor in love or life. It's just that it was no money around, but all those things were free. Fishing was free because I had all the canals around here and ponds in Victoria Park. 
also art was great because you know there's lots of art materials that um, always hanging around the house and very fortunate my father had a great friend who was head of a publication called IPC magazines and in those publications he he was a great mate of my dad because he loved magazines like practical boat builder practical woodworker practical homeowner and uh and he married a woman from New Zealand and she was a dyslexic expert. She came home from New Zealand. London was well behind in all that, you know, learning difficulties. But Valerie saw me as a four year old and said, I'll teach thee. So I never went to school. So I was home taught. So I went every day to their house. And luckily for me, the house uh, where I had to go was Dennis Gray, the man who had all these publications, um, there was no Apple Macs, there was no CGIs. What there was in those days, you had to make everything by hand. So if he was going to do an article on how to build a mirror dinghy for practical boat builder, he'd have to build it and make it. And in the house that I was taught, he had a studio and a workshop. So I would go in the morning and do my studies with Valerie at four years old. And then in the afternoon, I would go over and help Dennis in the studio and in his workshop. We would make the boat. We would paint the boat. We would make the sails. We would then do the photography to photograph the article, create the article. And then lo and behold, it would be published. So I did that. And it was just incredible. And I did that to the age of 13. I, at five years old, my mother bought me a sewing machine. My mother was Jewish. And she bought me a sewing machine so I could start making my own clothes. Now, trousers are difficult. Trousers, right? Zips are difficult to put in for a five-year-old. But dresses were very easy. So I used to get lots of colourful fabrics that were given to me. And I used to make dresses. Now, I was a little skinny blonde kid, five years old, never wore shoes, hair down to the floor. And I made all my own dresses. And I wore my dresses from five to 13. Um, living in this house, making things all the time, being taught by Valerie, Dennis teaching me. And then at 12 years old, luckily for me, he gave me my own double page spread in a magazine called Look and Learn. And it was the Steve Edge double page spread. And every month I'd have to come up with an idea and a story. So, you know, very easy. One month it would be Easter, how to decorate Easter eggs and make Easter cards. The following month it would how to design and make your tortoise hibernation box and create these articles. And I started getting paid for it. So I started getting money and I was extremely happy. How lucky were you to have Valerie at that time? Oh, I, I was so lucky. It was impossible because, you know, as I said, you were seen as the fool, the buffoon and, and somebody that just wanted to disrupt, but not at all. Valerie took me under a wing. She believed in me and actually I was extremely lucky. I mean, so, so lucky. I think, um, well, just hearing what you've said, it's that whole thing about just being, having the opportunity to be creative. And I think even still now, kids struggle with um, being taught about um, creativity and actually being part of a creative industry. So I really do feel at that time you were, you fell on your feet how did you find like friends and stuff if you were learning from home did you have many friends and or how did you go because it seems like you were quite surrounded by adults I was always surrounded by adults but I had brothers and right. brothers had friends so because my brothers had friends then I had friends but yeah otherwise but I was a cub too I did become a <laughs> cub so, so actually I had lots of friends in cubs um, how do you think your upbringing influenced how you are today? Well, it was it was all of it. I mean, you know, without that luck and, and being there at the right place with Valerie at the right time. But also my parents, my, both of my parents were artists. My dad was a painter and sculptor. My mum painted. And my dad had to work in those days because you had to. He was a uh, there was no grants for art. He had to work in the meat market. So he worked just around the corner here in Smithfield Meat Market. But he was a great character. He was incredibly funny. Here's my father here in the meat market. Wow. That's him on the right, by the way, just for you to know that. Um, and, and, and so, you know, he, he, he kind of was 
very relaxed and believed in me and allowed me to be free. He, he knew I found my passion. And, and when you find your passion, if you're a dyslexic or somebody with learning difficulties, they'll be good at it. And he believed that. And he allowed me to just do what I did. And, and, and that was a great advantage. But also, you know, the house I grew up in was a very happy household. It was incredibly happy. It was, although we had no money, we had love, we had life. And we had lots of animals. We grew up with animals. My father had swapped a motorbike BSA Bantam for a chimpanzee called Primo. So I grew up with a pet chimp and people used to shit themselves when they came around my house, you know, because sitting at the, sitting at the dinner table would be a fully grown chimpanzee. And my grandmother lived with us and she used to show off. And if we had a dinner party, the chimp would be at the dinner party with us, Primo. And my grandmother used to pass a packet of sweets around and Primo used to wait for his turn and people would be going, it's amazing, it's amazing. And a packet of sweet, Primo would take the sweets, look in the packet, boss eyed, it's amazing, it's amazing. Get hold of the sweet on the end of the wrapper, get hold of the other end of the wrapper, it's amazing. And on cue, unwrap the sweet, throw the sweet away and eat the wrapper. On cue, the chip. Anyway, so we grew up in this wonderful house. And, and as I said, we... I was allowed to do what I wanted to do. And I think that's what gave me my, my, my positive outlook on being who I am and being, like I said, that's all I wanted to do. I was very fortunate as well, be coming from no money. Money wasn't important to me. It wasn't, you know, you need to have money, but you don't need lots of money. And so the answer was I found my passion I didn't need to work anymore because I was so happy doing what I was doing, making things, creating things, painting things and living in my own little world. But actually, that was it for me. And, and so I was incredibly contented. So you said that you love um, glitter and colour and sewing and materials and the sewing machine. But when did you actually discover that you were talented, that you, it went beyond just a hobby and just a, a, a passion and a love and something that you enjoyed doing? When did you discover that you were actually talented and good at it? Well, I kind of, it was, it was because I just did it naturally. Um, and like I said, when I got my own double page spread, I was thinking, well, this is good. I'm getting some money now for what I love to do. And, and that was pretty good. But then there was a terrible knock at the door um, at 13 years old, what being home taught in this house when it was the government man, school board man that said, you've got to go to school now. And of course I answered the door in my dress and my long hair. And he said, can I, you know, he said, he said, can I speak? He said, is your brother here? So I'm thinking, what the f He said, uh, he said, well, he, he said, so I said, no. He said, well, can I speak to your mother and father? And anyway, Dennis came and he's, the guy didn't realise that I was Steve Edge dressed in the dress with the long hair. He assumed I was Steve Edge's sister. And um, anyway, by law, I had to go to school, um, which was a shock. But Dennis wrote a letter and I got a, went to a very posh school in Dulwich. But I lived in the art department for two years. And... Luckily, the head of art was amazing, allowed me to be in the art department because, as I said, I can't do any exams. I can't read any words. It doesn't go in. If I go to a railway station, it's a complete nightmare. But I obviously ask people as soon as I go in, being brought up in the way I have, I'm very proud of being dyslexic. I've never seen it as a disadvantage. It's been a great advantage. So I say to the first person in a railway station, excuse me, I'm dyslexic, can you help me? Now they think you're disabled, right? They think you can't walk, they grab your arm. Come with me, where do you wanna go? This man needs to go to Dorking, I don't care. They put me on the right train and I know I'm not gonna get lost. So, you know, I was fortunate and then, at, like I said, at 15, the, the head of art entered me in for this competition called European Artist of the Year competition. And there was three categories, 15 to 18, 18 to 24 and 24 above. And I won all three categories. Mm -hmm. And that's when I thought, that's pretty good. And, uh, and there was a, one of the big design agencies there, big European design agency and said, Steve, I'm 15, would you come and work with us? We want to give you a job. And it was like, whoa, when I said, yeah, too right. Anyway, I joined this big organization 
And luckily for me, their one of their main clients was the Muppet Show. Um, and they put me on the Muppet account. And, and I couldn't believe it because obviously I then started to was working with Jim Henson and Frank Oz uh, at 15. And then I carried on working. And, and then all of a sudden, uh, Jim Henson asked the, the owner of this business, could Steve come and work with us on the Muppet Show at ATV Studios? And luckily for me, he gave me his blessing and, and I went off and that was it. I went and I was working on the Muppet Show and every week there was Debbie Harry or Frank Sinatra or all these people. And of course, I thought I was terribly grown up. You know, I was not quite 16 and obviously, you know, they liked me. They thought the kid, he's a kid. What's the kid doing here? But I was obviously creating and working on all these wonderful things. And it was, it was truly amazing to work on that. Did you realise at the time how lucky you were or did you just think it was a job? What was your, can you remember what you? Well, yeah, it's a very interesting one, Katie, Lane, because, yeah, I, I, I just saw it as a job. I never, you know, I've never been, you know, I was never starstruck. It was weird. It was just that I just grew up. I treated everybody the same and everybody treated me. People liked me. So I just had a ball, you know, I was just always kind of seemed to be well looked after. So you say on your biog that you then met George Lucas. How did that come about and how did that relation and what did you go on to do? Well, that was a real shock because when I was working on that, uh, Jim Henson called me in one day and he said, Steve, um, there's a man over the road, he wants to meet you. Now, and so I, and so, where I, so I said to him, well, why are you getting rid of me? He said, I never said that. I said, listen where I come from, if somebody said, there's a man over the road, he wants to meet you, you're getting rid of me. He said, no, 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 no. It's the opposite. There's a great opportunity. He loves your work and he wants to meet you. You must go and see him. And I said, well, who have I got to go and see? He said, you have to go and see a man called George Lucas. And I went, who the f is George Lucas? He said, well, he's a producer. He's, a, he's, an, he's made a film called American Graffiti and he wants to see you. So I went over to EMI Studios and was taken up to a very posh office. And a very nice guy said to me, come and sit down. And he said, oh, Steve, I love everything you're doing. I went, thank you very much. Remember, I'm not quite 17, by the way. I've gone, I've been a year on the show. And, 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 and he says, I want you to come and work with us. So I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to work in the art department. I went, can I see the art department? He went, yes. I said, what do you want me to do in the art department? He went, <laughs> Anything you want, he said. So now remember, as long as I've got glitter, magic, marbles, and plastic scissors, I am fucking happy, right? So he takes me to this art department, all hands on, remember? There was carpentry shops, spray departments, ironmongery, bending machines, plastic vacuum form. I was going, look at that. I come back, I sat with him, I went, whoa, that's the best art department I've ever seen. He went, what do you reckon? I said, yeah, I said, I said, what's the film going to be about? He said, oh, it's going to be the greatest science fiction film ever. I said, what's it going to be called? He said, it's going to be called Star Wars. I went, that is a good name. He went, do you like it? I went, yeah. I said, that's an amazing name. Anyway, that was it. I worked on Star Wars. I worked on Empire Strikes Back. And then I worked on Raiders of the Lost Ark. And of wow. course, it was just an amazing time. So what would a normal day look like on a, on a set for George Lucas? So, yeah, it was, it was, it's, you know, it was a briefing meeting, you know, in the morning, big round table, all the creatives. And, and like I said, you know, you know, it, it's really interesting, you know, when you're a kid, like 17, you know, a 23 year old's an old person, right? So I used to be thinking I was surrounded by old, kind of quite old people, but, um, and, and, and so Norman, Re Norman Reynolds, the creative director, would then give the briefing and then he'll point to me and go, OK, Steve, I want you to go to soundstage seven. There's been a Zion cannon attack on the stormtroopers. Make sure they lost the Zion cannon, you know, and it's like, wow, of course, I've got it straight away. I knew exactly what Zion cannon attack was like. And I would go down and then bash the hell out of all these stormtrooper suits you know, soldering irons and uh, uh, airbrushes and make sure they lost the Zion cannon attack. So every day it was just fantastic. And then 
And then with, and then when I was working on Empire Strikes Back, um, my uh, uh, they wanted some snakes on the Dagobah system with Yoda, and uh, they didn't have any. And I said to George, I went, my dad's got snakes. He said, I'll oh, get get your dad. And my dad came along and got we supplied the snakes. And then of course, so when Raiders of the Lost Ark came along, uh, my dad supplied all the snakes, and it was my pet monkey Snuff who was on the film. Um, here's me, here's me with my pet monkey. This is me with my pet monkey Snuff, and there's Harrison Indiana Jones. Um, and 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 also, what was so funny was that when it was in the Well of Souls, the stunt woman wouldn't go in the snakes because there was six thousand snakes. There was a lot of snakes snapping because they were coming from all sorts of different places. And uh, and Spielberg, Stephen, come and got me and said, Steve, come with me. So I had my legs shaved and I wore the party dress and it's me in the snake pit. So next time you see that film, Raiders, they're my legs in that pit. I think that's for everyone. I think we've all got to go and watch, re go and re-watch <laughs> these films. And so you then went and um, started your own branding agency. How did you go from snake pits and uh, crazy uh, film studios to this, I suppose, quite, I mean, was it, was it quite a commercial branding agency? What was the, you know, what was the leap? What, what happened? That's a good one, Katie. I mean, basically, I love stories. And I always love the stories of all these characters and what, and of course, you know, about brands. I've always loved brands. And and what happened was when I decided to create something to bring a twist and bring a difference, it was always about how do you communicate, and especially to dyslexic people and people with learning difficulties. I was always interested in how do you how do you give information that people can understand. So I decided that I was going to set up a my own design agency, and and at that time it was like. You know, I didn't really know I was going to specialize in one thing, but, you know, I was good at making stuff. I was good at exhibition. I could do exhibitions. I could do all sorts of things. So I started. And But then what happened, because of the film industry and people I'd met, all of a sudden Cartier came to me, first of all, and said, we need help to look at this story. And then I started working with Cartier and worked with Christian Dior. And all of a sudden, then it became the thing was branding. I love branding. and. And, and then I got some assistance and then we started purely working on brands and creating stories, finding that something to hang your hat on and then building a fabulous story and creating a wow image. Because at the end of the day, people want to look at beautiful things. It doesn't matter about, you know, it has to be authentic. You have to find something authentic to hang your hat on. And then from that, you can create a fabulous brand. And that's what I started to do. So from that, what has been, you've done so much and had the most crazy, I suppose, upbringing career and totally reverent. What has been the most defining moment of your career? I think the most defining moment of my career was when I realised that I had a company, um, a design company, because up until then I called it a studio. And I got, you know, like I said, I needed an assistant. So I've got an assistant. And then, I, and then I needed another assistant. We got busier. I got another assistant. And all of a sudden, I realized that I've got like, there's me and nine designers. And then I'm thinking, and then we're all going, hang on a second, who's invoicing? Who's chasing the money? Who's doing that? And then we realized we, we have a company here. We need to start organizing it properly. And that was the moment I thought, wow, we've got a company. I've now got a company and we need to get a person that can do the invoicing, can chase the money, can make sure this happens. And then all of a sudden the organization started to happen and I looked at it and I thought, wow, I'd never believe I'd have a company. Incredible. I mean, it is incredible. I, I think especially, you know, just the, the whole story is truly, I, I mean, I love it. Because I just think it's so, I suppose, just so crazy. <laughs> So when in your biog as well, you mentioned a commitment to lateral, not literal thinking. Mm. And you have um, something called the outer thinking division. Yeah. A little bit more about that. So because of 
what I wanted to create was that thing, what I said earlier on, it was about, you know, companies come to us, a lot of companies, whether they're a law firm, whether they're a fashion brand, whether they're a, a big construction company, every time I ask them about them, they always go with different. And I go, why are you different? And they go, because we are. And I go, no, you brother trust me you ain't different <laughs> you like to think you're different and you believe that you're different but actually we will find your difference and the thing about information and communication is that if you go to anybody's website especially in any industry whether they are a law firm all talking the same jargon too much information you can't find what you're looking for or whether it's a construction company again they all copy each other they all say the same thing. How can you be different without being different? And, the, and for us, it was for me, how do I find difference? And the difference is instead of being literal, it's about being lateral. And the thing about being lateral is that true twist. And that twist is to get rid of all the jargon, spoon feed information that people want. Even people with dyslexia, you want them to be customers because imagine Richard Branson, he's a good boy. He's got lots of dough. You'd like him to be your customer, right? And he's a great dyslexic. So, you know, it was about keeping things simple, keeping it that everybody can understand it and actually putting a twist on it that makes it fascinating and fun. Also bring, you know, like a fun to the table. Everybody wants to be around fun. Fun never degrades professionalism. It's the opposite. If you can work with a company that has fun, trust me, good work comes from it. So it was about bringing all these ideas to the table. And the outer thinking division was that I was asked to sit for a year as a brand guru with O2, the, the phone company O2. They choose 12 people around the world to go into a bunker every month that they pay you and you can talk gobbledygook. Chatham House rules. You can talk about what you want, that subject, and everybody debates it. And, and I kind of like that concept. So I was every month going under the bunkers with all these people, head of Facebook and all those types, and we discussed and debated. And it's amazing when you sit around the table and, for instance, you know, if you start talking about how important making a fire outdoors is, how all of a sudden people start to get involved and talk about, yeah, th their experience of, making a fire in the woods, sitting out at night in front of it. What does it mean? And then another story comes from it. And I love that formulas of, of tapping into people's ideas about by bringing something very simple to the table, but then the debate takes off from that. That's the... Well, I think too often we don't debate and we don't talk enough. We just see what's in front of us and then, and, you know, and go from there. Exactly. So there were three things you'd like us to know what would they be? So first of all, no one's as professional as you think they are, all right, guys out there, don't worry. No one is as professional as you think they are. They all have their little packed lunch in their drawer, doesn't matter how big the head of the biggest <laughs> bank is. Remember that one, you know. Um, always believe in yourself, especially in this creative industry. There's a lot of people that want to, you know, say things and kind of be nasty, <laughs> them all off. Just believe in who you are. And especially when it comes to you guys creatively going to have to present stuff. Remember, a blank sheet of paper, you, um, you're, um, you go into a meeting because these people, they haven't got a clue and they've asked you to get involved to help in this creativity. And, you know, they start with a blank sheet of paper. But of course, what's interesting about it, blank sheet of paper, they've got no idea. But as soon as you put something on it and show them, they all be <laughs> experts. Everybody in that boardroom is a expert. <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't do that if I was you. I don't like that colour. What the <laughs> do you know about branding or colour? But yet they all want to get involved. And that's what's so interesting is, and I always say, listen, we don't design by committee. Because if you design by committee, the thoroughbred horse becomes a camel real <laughs> quick. Trust me. And you want to make sure that you be strong, fight your corner, and never let these people try and add to what they think they know because they don't. You're going to be the best, and you're going to go out there, and you will be the best. Never listen to them. So I absolutely love their great tips. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love your dress. 
and I love the way you dress and you literally make me smile and I um when I first met you you said dress to the party and the party will come to you and I actually do do that I love dressing up and um can you tell us about how you choose what you're going to wear each day or is it just what do you do get up in the morning and just go I fancy wearing gold with green and <laughs> how do you go about that very good question, Katie. And of course, what's it? What? Yeah. First of all, you know, you can be very lazy. There's a lot of lazy people out there, right? And they'll wear grey tracksuits every day, right? And for me, every morning I get up, I don't know what I'm going to wear, but I find it very exciting to go to my magic wardrobe, open my wardrobe, and there I'm looking at all my outfits. Now, of course, you know, Katie, it's difficult. It's not easy. Sometimes you're in a hurry. But you know what? Doesn't matter. It's a very important that you spend that time and that energy and you find something that you're going to feel really good in. But every day you're going to go out and fight your battle. And of course, that thing about, as I said, you know, my philosophy, luckily at nine years old, coming from a poor family, in all poor families, you have a rich aunt. And I had my rich aunt and uh, she... Uh, we used to go around there and she had cabinets and glass and cut crystal. And I said to her one day, when do you use all this? And she said, on special occasions. And a week later, she died and never used any of it. And I'm with my Jewish mum. And I said to my mum at nine years old, I said, mum, you know what? I'm never going to wait for a special occasion any anymore because I had one party outfit my mum had got me. One, literally. And I said, I'm going to wear my party outfit every day. I said, I'm going to dress for a party every day. And the party will come to me because we're a long time dead, mum. So all of you out there now, remember, get your best little silver backless number on, your white tuxedo, and trust me, you'll go out and every day you'll have a party and people will go, wow, where are you going? What's that? And the party will happen around you. Never wait for a special occasion. Get it on now. Well, I I try to. It's not always beautiful, <laughs> and sometimes I do. And then I wish that I hadn't worn it because I think, oh, it's so impractical. But I I'm, I totally follow uh, follow you in it in that regard. Um, so, who and what inspires you? So, people don't actually inspire me because people are already inspired by other things. So they're actually changing and inspiring and different for me. I love objects. I have a relationship with objects. And, I, and when I find an object that I absolutely love and it makes me happy, then it becomes a relationship. And so I'm surrounded by things and objects that I love. And actually, they, they're the things that inspire me with colour, with stories, and also, like I said, make me smile all the time because I'm surrounded by, I suppose, all, all of these great friends of mine that I love being with. Um, there was a, there's a great film out there called, uh, sounds one of those precocious, pretentious art movies called, called The Marriage of the Berlin uh, Wall. And um, <coughs> basically someone marries the Berlin Wall in the film and she loves it so much and marries it. It's a true story. But there's a condition that people have with objects. Anyway, apparently I've got this condition. <laughs> I, I, I love objects and they you, inspire me. Are you a hoarder? Do you have loads of stuff everywhere or around your house? You seem to have a great backdrop, back, backdrop there. I love things, but not a hoarder. As if, if I don't touch it, I get rid of it. Because we've always lived in lofts and open plan buildings, uh, the rule has always been you can have what you want as long as you use it. And if you don't touch it or use it, you get rid of it. So we don't hoard. It, it seems we go to the charity shop every week, it seems, but it's something that we do. Okay. I'm now going to do the quick fire round. So this is sharp and snappy. Okay. So I'm going to start off. What is the one thing that annoys you the most? Ketchup on my hands. I can't cope. My phobia is ketchup. And it kills me, so I can't have ketchup on my hands. I'm not going to even ask. If you could talk to the Prime Minister, what's the one thing you'd say? When will you and your government take art seriously? The art seriously. When will you do that? 
What piece of clothing or accessories can someone someone else wear that immediately makes you have a bad opinion of them? Middle-aged men wearing a V-neck sweater without a shirt underneath it with horrible little hair, uh, chest hair, giving it the big and like those golfers do. Sorry, golfers out there, it's hideous. What fashion trend do you just not get? Oh, geeky cheeky. I'm afraid. I, I, I just find it horrendous. And those giant fridge freezer trainers that people wear, it's like, how the f you walk around with them? Marmite, love it or hate it? I love it. If you were stranded on a tropical island, two things that you'd take with you? I'd take a fishing rod and a pair of binoculars so that I could actually keep yeah. active fishing and I could look at all the wonderful things on the island. When are you most productive? All the time, actually. I'm lucky I was born with energy. I wake up every morning happy and excited and every moment is, is I'm on it. What was the last thing you fixed? The last thing I fixed, we have a, I have a cabin in the woods, very luckily, that I built many years ago, a place called Box Hill. And I built another cabin, which is a workshop to make sure I can keep fixing everything that needs to be fixed. And I have a big outdoor fire, like one of these big outdoor barbecues, and I've had it for about 30 years, and it had all cracked and was going to fall down. And I decided I shouldn't really replace it, I should fix it. So I drilled all holes between all the cracks and then stitched it with copper wire, refilled it with cement and repainted it and recovered it in broken bottles and made the whole thing revived again. And that's made me very happy because we can't throw things away anymore, you know. Even if you, even if your iron doesn't work anymore, do you know what? You can actually, there's screws to take it apart and, and you might find, um, and you might find that there is a, a wire loose. And so therefore you can fix it yourself. So before you throw anything away, it's a great question, uh, Katie Darling, try fixing stuff because we have to save the planet. We have to make sure that we don't keep consuming and actually, you can fix everything, really. Could you survive in the wilderness for a week? Sounds like you could. Yeah, very easy. <laughs> very, very easy. Um, tea or coffee? Tea. I have one cup, of, one cup of coffee every morning and that's it. And then tea for the rest of the day. What song do you know off by heart? So I'm completely tone deaf. and But luckily, never learning songs. But being a cub, we had to do gang shows. So... Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner is probably the thing that I know off by heart. What looks delicious but tastes terrible? Squirrel. It's, it's disgusting. Squirrel looks lovely, but you try eating it. It doesn't taste like chicken, trust me. <laughs> what would you rather be, hot or cold? Oh, hot. I have to be hot. I can't bear being cold. I hate being cold. On a scale to one to ten, how cool are you? I don't do cool. It's not in my makeup. All it is is that I can only wear and be comfortable in my own skin. And you are what you are. And because I've always loved colour, I've always loved clothes, and I don't give a f about what anybody thinks because who are they to judge anybody in what you're wearing or who you are? So luckily, I just wear what I am, do what I do, and actually I'm very, very happy. So I don't know cool. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to ask the audience if they've got any questions for the chat. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much for your time from me and my questions. And um, I always love how, I suppose, just joyful um, you make me. You've had an incredible, extraordinary life, extraordinary career. And um, thank you so much for... Um, well, thank you so much for today. Have we got any questions from um, the audience at all? Let me just look on the chat. Um, brilliant, fascinating, amazing, hilarious, entertainment, honest and true. Thank you, Steve and Katie for hosting. That's from Eleanor. Thanks, Eleanor. Thanks for joining us. Um, amazing and inspirational, full of energy, fabulous. Um, some people don't like your swearing, Steve, so you're going to have to roll that in with a TI uh, in future. Uh, <laughs> story and narrative, essential to branding key success. So you've got loads of really nice, um, proud member. Thank you, Steve. You have accelerated me. Loads of comments. Uh, yeah, any questions?
Otherwise, I will call it a day and let Steve go and do something incredible with some colour glitter and some pens. Oh, yeah. Hi, Katie. Yeah, we've just got a couple a couple here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can indeed. Hi, it's, it's, it's Steph. So um, we, we all really want to know if you have any celebrity friends, apart from George Lucas, of course. Yes. Yes, I do. I'm very lucky. Can you I name have... them? <laughs> yeah, I have names like you know, Fogel Sharkey, who was a very good guy, teenage kicks. Uh, Mark Noble, who's the captain of West Ham football team. Uh, Harrison Ford. Uh, I worked with w some great restaurateurs and chefs, Giorgio Locatelli and Mark Hicks. Also very good with Paul McCartney and Steven Spielberg. So I'm very lucky. Lots of fantastic celebrities. Oh, wow. <laughs> So obviously, I mean, you absolutely love what you do. Um, but if you didn't do what you do and you weren't a designer, what do you think you would do? It's a very good question. I think I'd be an explorer. I would love oh, wow. to go exploring, living outdoors and going to different places, climbing mountains and, and, and all that. Fabulous. And then have you got anything maybe that's upcoming, like a project that you can tell us about? What, what's, ne what's next? <laughs> It's very interesting. There's some very interesting projects that we're working on. It's definitely, you know, about everything's environmental now. We're seeing we're working with an incredible paint company called Lakeland, and it improves the air quality in your home. This paint, you can actually eat the paint. It's that environmental friendly. It's an incredible company called Lakeland. We're just branding the greenest building in Europe here in London. It has a hundred trees being planted on the roof of the building here in Blackfriars called wow. Roots, in, Roots in the Sky. I'm just doing a lovely design or the, um, uh, and for Fennec, they have collabs with the brands they work with in their fashion brands. Um, and I'm doing the lining, their anniversary lining for this collab, but also the lining for all of their clobber, which is a really nice project to be working with. So yeah, all sorts of wonderful things we're working on. Wow, <laughs> so so varied. Yeah, so they're, they're the things that we all we, we all have to know before you finish today. So thank you so much. And I mean, obviously, just from the staff's point of view, we've so enjoyed working with you and the team. They've been absolutely incredible, and it's been such a joyous, wonderful experience. And they've really helped us. And I say the feedback is coming in daily and it's it's just it's just one it's just wonderful and everyone our friends our partners and our colleagues are just so happy to be able to go on the website and actually find what they what they want to see so it's it's a big thing publicly a big thank you from, from well, us all well thank you darling it's been a it was it's been a real pleasure you know we've worked with lots of old brands you know we branded lock hats which was 1676 Fortnum and Mason, 1707, Garrard's, 1535, and of course, Textile, 1910. So yeah. it's fantastic to making sure the past has a future. And for me, that's what I love to do. It's these incredible brands that have been around for a reason. They're great. They're amazing. They're the best. And they will always keep going. And that's why it's been a real honor to work with you guys. And we'll carry on working with you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks for your time. And thanks everyone for staying after the AGM and um, and listening to us chat. And um, Steve, I will be probably phoning you later just to find out all the other things I want to know after our, our talk as well. Uh, please do. And if any of you guys want to see any more dodgy outfits, look at Steve Edge's Instagram and you can see wardrobes and wardrobes of clobber. <laughs> I don't think they're dodgy. I, I, I probably... <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for joining Thank us you. and thanks for your time. It's Thank been you. really fun. Thank you all.